I approach my list of investment candidates with a healthy dose of skepticism. My best friend in the whole world and it comes to building my inventory of value investing opportunities is the no thank you pile. If there is something you do not understand or are not comfortable with, in the no thank you pile it should go. If a company has too many problems, too much debt, union and pension problems, stiff foreign competition, on the pile it goes. I have the luxury of filling my store with merchandise I am comfortable with and want to own for the long-term wealth building it offers. Chapter 12 Give the company a physical A thorough checkup will help avoid investing mistakes. Now that we have a list of candidates and have determined the reasons the stock is cheap, it is time to figure out what the company is actually worth. Start by examining the balance sheet. Much as a doctor consults patients' charts to see what condition they are in, look to the balance sheet to see what shape the company is in. The doctor needs to know all the vital signs to make a diagnosis. A balance sheet is effectively a company's medical chart, a snapshot of its financial condition at a given point in time. It shows how solvent the company is and exactly what shape, good or bad, it is in. Here is where you begin to develop a better idea of what the company is actually worth, how much it owes, and what resources it has to survive going forward. The balance sheets show what assets can be quickly converted to cash, and what fixed assets like factories and equipment are owned. The balance sheet also tells how much money the company owes. And its net worth. It is basically the same form you fill out when you apply for a loan. One of the most important aspects of the balance sheet is liquidity. Liquidity is the amount of cash the company can lay its hands on in the short term. Liquidity provides the flexibility to withstand down cycles in the economy, pay dividends to shareholders, buy back stock, and take advantage of future opportunities. You also want to make sure that the company is not overly burdened with debt, and that there is enough capital to stay in business during bad times. The first place to look on the balance sheet is the category of current assets. Here the company lists all its cash and assets that can be turned into cash in a relatively short period such as a year or less. This includes short-term investments such as T-bills, inventories that are finished products ready for sale or products that are in the process of being manufactured, and receivables from customers who have bought their products. Next is the current liabilities section of the balance sheet. As current assets are assets that can generally be converted to cash in a year or less, current liabilities are debts that fall due within a year or less. They include such items as interest payments on the company borrowings and accounts payable to the company's suppliers, as well as taxes owed but not yet paid. Dividing current liabilities into current assets gives us an important ratio in balance sheet analysis, the current ratio. This ratio reveals a company's ability to pay its short-term obligations. A rough rule of thumb is a ratio of 2 to 1, that is, the company has twice the amount of liquid assets as it has short-term debts and obligations. This can vary depending on the business, but I like to err on the conservative side. It is also helpful to compare this number to other companies in the same industry. By comparing companies in the same industry, the investor can then determine which companies are in better financial shape when compared against the industry. Average, a lower ratio may indicate possible liquidity problems. It is also important to look at the ratio over the past several years. A current ratio that is steadily declining year over year may indicate that a serious liquidity problem is developing. It is also helpful to examine the relationship in cash terms. When you subtract the current liabilities from the current assets, you have calculated what is known as working capital. The rule of thumb here is simply the more the better. It is also a good idea to see if this number is rising or falling over the years. A variation of the current ratio, known as the quick ratio, removes inventory from the calculation. Although inventory can usually be converted to cash, it may be impossible for the company to receive full value for inventory if it is subject to a fire sale. This is also sometimes called the acid test ratio and gives a clear view of a company's cash position versus its bills. 
It is also a good idea to track inventory levels over the past several years to see if they have been steadily rising in relationship to the company's sales. Rising inventories may indicate a product that has decreased in popularity and will be difficult to sell at a profit. Next, look at the company's long-term assets and debts. Long-term assets include real estate, factories, warehouses, and equipment, and investments in subsidiaries or stocks that it has no intention of selling. Intangible assets such as patents, trademarks, or copyrights are also listed as long-term assets. I tend to take these assets out of my calculations as their value may be difficult to determine. The value of intangible assets should be reflected in the company's earnings, which we will get to later. Once I have an idea of how much the company owns, I turn to what it owes. Long-term liabilities include all debt that is due longer than one year from now. This includes bank loans, public and private bond issues, and long-term leases for property or equipment. Again, it is useful to observe trends over the past few years. Are liabilities growing faster than assets? This could be an indication that the company has to borrow more and more money just to stay afloat. Likewise, a situation where long-term debt is declining year over year while assets are rising indicates that the company is generating excess cash and using it to pay down debt, a healthy indication for the years ahead. When I subtract all that the company owes from all that it owns, I get shareholder equity, or book value. This final book value is simply a more detailed form of the value discussed in Chapter 5. It is the ultimate measure of how equity has built up over the years both from money raised and earnings retained and reinvested in the business. Again, I prefer to subtract intangible assets from this number to get a better picture of how much actual equity there is in a company that could potentially be realized if needed. Another measure that gives us a good idea of a company's solvency and ability to survive is the debt-to-equity ratio. This is the total debt, both long and short term, divided by the shareholder equity. If the number is higher than 1, we know that the company is funded primarily by debt rather than equity investment. This is not necessarily the end of the world, but it means you need to investigate further. It pays to compare this number with that of other companies in the same industry. A stable business such as a public utility can service more debt than a young technology company that needs cash to reinvest in research and development of new products. In general, a high debt-to-equity ratio means that a company has been financing its growth by borrowing. Leveraging the company by increasing debt levels is a double-edged sword. If a company can invest the money it borrows, and earn a higher return than it pays in interest, it should be able to quickly improve its profits. If it cannot earn a higher return than the interest it pays, there is a real danger of default and bankruptcy down the road. The less debt on the balance sheet, the greater the margin of safety. The balance sheet is the starting point. You are primarily looking for red flags that may tip you off that the company has more serious problems than you originally thought. Evaluating not only the levels of debt, assets, and working capital but the trends in each can give you valuable information about the company's health and future prospects. Comparing the leverage ratios of a company with others in the same industry also indicates its competitive position and its ability to ride out adverse economic times. It is here that you begin to understand how solid the book value of a company is. Recall that a low price-to-book value ratio is one characteristic of a winning stock. If the book value of a company contains a lot of intangible assets like goodwill, or excessive inventory in relation to its sales, it may not be quite the bargain we thought. Sometimes, however, you may find that the book value is understated. Land or stock investments acquired years earlier may be carried on the balance sheet at cost. These assets may have appreciated over the years, and the stock may be even more of a bargain than we originally thought. I have found this to be true several times over the years, particularly in foreign stocks. Remember, winning in the investment game means not losing. A strong balance sheet is a good indicator of a company's stamina, its ability to survive when the going gets tough. 
Once you have satisfied yourself that a company is resting on a solid foundation, it is time to look at its earnings prospects. Chapter 13 Physical Exam, Part 2 The stock checks out okay, but what can it earn? Once you are satisfied that a company is on firm financial ground with a strong balance sheet, it is time to examine the income statement. The income statement is simply a record of how much money the company took in over a period of time, its sales or revenues, and how much it paid out, its expenses, over the same period. Most companies report income on both a quarterly and an annual basis. The annual income statement is more useful because some companies experienced seasonal sales fluctuations. Retailers in particular see large swings, as a significant part of their business occurs around the year-end holidays. Remember, the prices of the vast majority of stocks are driven by earnings. The first line of the income statement is the company's sales or revenues. These terms are interchangeable. In general, service companies have revenues, and manufacturing companies have sales. Revenues or sales are the lifeblood of the company. Without them, a company can't earn a profit. While revenues in any given year are important, they only have meaning when compared with previous years. Most company annual reports show revenues and earnings for the past five years. A look at the top line revenue growth gives us an idea of how the business is progressing. Revenues growing over time are good. Conversely, declining revenues may be a cause for concern. In addition, many companies have different divisions making different products, and break out revenues by division or product line. It can be helpful to see exactly where the revenues are coming from. A particularly well-performing division may be masking problems in a company's core business. Conversely, a particularly poorly performing division may hide the overall strength of the core business. This is true both for revenues and net income. Having analyzed the revenue line, now turn your attention to the expense side of the ledger. First comes the cost of goods sold. This is the direct cost of producing whatever product or service the company sells. It includes the raw material and manufacturing slash labor cost of making the company's product. This number can fluctuate over time. If it is rising as a percentage of revenues, it may indicate that rising costs that cannot be passed on to the customer are squeezing the long-term potential for profits. Or the number can indicate that the company faces new competition that may also squeeze profits. Sometimes higher expenses may indicate softening demand that may or may not be due to cyclical effects. Companies often discount the price of their products to move inventory off the shelf. After deducting the cost of goods sold, you arrive at the gross profit. The percentage of gross profit divided by sales is the gross profit margin. I like for this to be a fairly stable number, but often it is not. It tends to fluctuate with demand for the company's products or services. The steadier the gross profit margin, the better the business. From the gross profit margin, we now subtract operating expenses, called selling, general and administrative expenses, in the income statement. These are all those fixed expenses like the headquarters and all those employees who are not directly involved in producing whatever the company sells. The lower this number is as a percentage of sales, the better. A high or growing level of operating expenses could indicate bloated salaries or a less than watchful eye on overall expenses. Once you have this figure, you have the operating profit, or earnings before interest and taxes. This is the number that I like to use in valuing a company, as it is the figure most likely to be used by anyone interested in acquiring the entire company. Interest expense, taxes, and depreciation are subtracted from operating profit to derive the final earnings for the time period. Depreciation reflects the loss of value of fixed assets such as the company's buildings, machinery, and equipment as they wear out. One other line is frequently added or subtracted from the operating profit, and it should be investigated rather closely. A company that appears to sell for six or seven times earnings may have earnings grossly inflated by a large one-time gain from the sale of a subsidiary or real estate. 
Since such one-time events are unlikely to occur every year, the one-time gain needs to be taken out. These are extraordinary items that do not recur with any predictability. There may also be extraordinary losses, such as expenses incurred in closing down a money-losing division that will not have any recurring effect on the company's ongoing operations. You might determine that earnings will be higher next. Year without these losses and the shares may be even cheaper than you first. Thought Now that you have a bottom-line net profit number after accounting for all expenses, you can calculate the earnings per share that is used in measuring the stock. This is net profits divided by the number of shares outstanding. This gives you the earnings per share for the company. Simple, right? Well, not exactly. Many companies have granted options to executives that may be converted into stock, or have issued bonds, preferred stock, or warrants that can be converted into shares. For that reason, you must also calculate the diluted earnings per share EPS, if all convertible instruments were converted into stock. A number here that is very low compared with the original EPS is a warning sign that perhaps the shares are not as cheap as they first appeared. Again, I like to use the earnings before interest and taxes to determine both regular and fully diluted earnings per share numbers. In my opinion, it is a more accurate measure of corporate earning power. The most revealing aspect of the income statement is the trend over 5 or 10 years. Are revenues rising or falling? Are expenses staying in line with revenues? Are profits consistent or uneven? Is there a cyclical pattern to earnings such as would be the case with economically sensitive companies? Are profits growing? Are there a lot of one-time charges or gains that indicate the company may be manufacturing or massaging the bottom line? I. Also look closely at the shares outstanding. A rising number may indicate that excessive stock options are being granted to executives, and this will dilute my share of corporate profits. Increasing shares outstanding can also indicate that the company is financing itself through stock offerings rather than earnings. A declining number indicates that the company is actively buying its own shares, which, as discussed in Chapter 8, is usually a good sign. But watch to see that the company walks its talk. Sometimes a company may announce its intention to buy back stock but never actually makes the purchases. In the income statement, I can see if the shares outstanding are actually falling on a year-to-year -year basis. Once you have a fair picture of a company's earnings, you can focus on other important ratios. One of the more important ratios I like to look at is return on capital ROC. This is calculated by dividing earnings in any given year by the beginning year's capital, stockholder equity plus debt. This is a good measure of how much money a company can earn on the capital it employs. A company with a high return on capital has a much greater chance of financing growth with self-generated cash than one with a low return. Again, you should be mindful of the trends. At a minimum, I like to see stability. This indicates that management is doing an adequate job of investing and managing the reinvested profits each year. A rising ROC would tell me that they are doing a fantastic job of reinvesting profits. Conversely, a declining ROC, especially on a consistent basis, might indicate that management is not really growing the business and reinvesting. At the same level of profitability. The ideal company needs more capital that. It can reinvest in its business at a high rate of return. Far too often, this is not the case. Often, every dollar of earnings reinvested in the business earns a lower return than the previous dollar. In the 1980s, Philip Morris was one of the most profitable companies in the United States, but because it was in the politically incorrect business of selling cigarettes, it sold for only nine times after tax earnings. I will refrain from making any value judgments on the cigarette business here. Philip Morris could not reinvest its earnings in the cigarette business because it was simply too profitable and did not need new investment. So the firm launched a series of acquisitions of food companies, presumably to recast itself in a better light. It bought General Foods for approximately 15 times earnings and Kraft Foods for nearly 20 times earnings. Wasn't their own stock a better deal at 9 times earnings? 
wouldn't. The shareholders of Philip Morris have been better off with the company buying in its own shares or paying out generous dividends. It is also important to consider the net profit margin. This is simply the earnings divided by the total revenues. If a company can grow its profit margins over time, every new dollar of goods sold has a leveraged impact on sales. Again, at a minimum, I like to see a consistent profit margin over a span of time. Investors who paid close attention to net profit margins could have predicted that the price wars in telecommunications, computers, and autos over the past few years were going to negatively impact earnings, and they could have exited the stocks before prices collapsed. A falling margin could also indicate bloated overhead and careless management, or cutthroat competition, something we very much want to avoid as we stock the shelves of our store. Analyzing an income statement may seem difficult at first. It need not be. Once you have a basic understanding of what you are looking for in all the numbers, it becomes a relatively simple task to make the important calculations and comparisons. If you cannot understand a company's income statement, just put that company in the no thank you pile instead of feeling that you are not smart enough to figure it out. A lot of reputedly smart professional analysts could not figure out Enron's income statement, but that did not stop them from becoming big fans of the stock. Now that you have put together a list of candidates and have determined that they have strong balance sheets and earnings, it is time to put it all together and finalize your selections. Chapter 14 Send your stocks to the Mayo Clinic For a thorough examination, use these easy tips from a professional. If you really want to get under the skin of a company, really try to understand its competitive position and growth prospects, you should ask a series of questions. Book value, cheap earnings, balance sheet analysis, all these metrics are key to identifying good prospects. But if successful investing was as simple as a mathematical formula, everyone would have nothing but winners in their portfolios. There is some art to identifying the best prospects, and so you should analyze your list of companies in greater detail. You need to drill down farther to get a better sense of how these companies operate and compete. Getting answers to these questions will give you a more in-depth knowledge of a company and its potential as a successful investment. 1. What is the outlook for pricing for the company's products? Can the company raise prices? Each dollar of price increase will increase pre-tax income by $1 if costs do not increase. A company with a product that is in demand can easily raise prices to generate more profit. If costs remain the same, every extra dollar will go straight to the bottom line. For years, Philip Morris could raise the price of a pack of cigarettes pretty much whenever it wanted. At one point, Harley-Davidson could price its motorcycles at a premium to its competitors because demand was so strong. Technology companies, however, are in a highly competitive environment that makes it difficult to raise prices, there is another computer company around every corner ready to lower prices. The same holds true for grocery businesses. Walmart puts downward pricing pressure on all its competitors because it buys in volume at lower prices, and its other costs are less because it is more efficient. Also, if demand for a product is waning in a particular industry, no amount of good business practices will allow for price increases. In the past few years, some events and trends have allowed certain industries to raise prices with little ceiling pressure. Home builders could raise prices due to ever increasing demand. Post Katrina, insurance companies raised prices as many people and businesses scrambled to buy extra disaster insurance. The less competition in an industry, the easier it is to increase prices. 2. Can the company sell more? What is the outlook for units? A 10% hike in units will increase gross profits by 10% if the gross profit margin does not change. Pre-tax income will go up by this amount if other costs do not increase. The simplest way to raise the bottom line is to sell more products or services. Assuming that costs remain about the same, every increase in the number of units sold improves the bottom line. 
When Johnson & Johnson sold off during the healthcare reform scare of the early 1990s, the underlying business conditions were not deteriorating. An aging population was going to lead to more demand not only for prescription drugs but also for over-the-counter medicines like Tylenol. When recently looking at a uniform and protective clothing business it seemed clear that ever-increasing safety regulations for employers would push up the demand for its products. However, it is important to make sure that increased sales are not done through incentives or giveaways. In 2005, U.S. auto companies saw booming sales but they made little if any money off the increase in revenues. The friends and family pricing programs being offered to everyone hurt profit margins. And some companies will never be able to increase sales. Look at the travel agency business. Who needs them when you can book plane tickets and hotels online? 3. Can the company increase profits on existing sales? What is the outlook for the gross profit margin as a percentage of sales? How much is the gross profit margin expected to increase or decrease as a result of changes in price, mix of business, or the specific costs that make up the cost of goods sold? If it is not possible to sell more, is it possible to squeeze more profit out of what is already being sold? Can the company cut product costs by changing suppliers or shipping methods? Or, as in the case of ABC Ice Cream, can it change its product mix to focus on more profitable lines of business to raise its profit margin? In 2006, many of the major media companies are diversifying away from the mainline newspaper business as circulation flattens and ad sales decrease. Companies like the New York Times and the Tribune Company are looking to increase their presence in the more profitable online world to boost overall margins and revenues. Wall Mart never hesitates to change suppliers if it will squeeze extra profit out of a particular product line. I also keep a watchful eye out for companies that cannot control their most basic costs. Industries like trucking or the airlines have little control over fuel costs, and a cookie company cannot control the cost of sugar. 4. Can the company control expenses? What is the outlook for selling, general, and administrative costs slash margin as a percentage of sales. Have there been any changes and, if so, what are they? Is there any way for the company to cut costs not related to making the product? Are overhead, salaries, and other employee expenses out of line? Can the company close expensive or outdated production facilities? Is a new technology available that will allow it to raise its overall profit margin? Can it lay off employees to reduce overhead? Can it refinance debt at lower rates and let the savings accrue to the bottom line? All too often, companies let expenses get out of control and it becomes necessary to make cutbacks to restore profitability. Every dollar saved, whether in the price of paper clips or healthcare costs, flows to the bottom line and helps to restore profitability. 5. If the company does raise sales, how much of it will fall to the bottom line. If sales can be grown at no additional cost, every dollar goes right to bottom line profits. If, however, a company has to hire additional salespeople, build new plants, or add additional shipping costs to gain growth, the increased sales will not all translate into bottom line profit. As mentioned, if increased sales are based on incentives and price cuts, the percentage of profit will be low. Often the cost of gaining revenue and market share can actually cause profit margins to fall or even reduce a company's profits. This frequently happens in technology companies where the cost of gaining business may exceed the profit potential of the business. On the flip side, Walmart and Harley-Davidson are great examples of companies that have maintained tremendous revenue growth while holding or even increasing their pre-tax profit margins. 6. Can the company be as profitable as it used to be? 6. Can the company be as profitable as it used to be, or at least as profitable as its competitors? Often I will see a company where the profit margin falls well below previous levels. If this is due to a temporary problem, the company should regain its profitability. It may have stumbled due to management error, a new product that bombed in the marketplace, or expenses that temporarily got out of control. The reason for falling profits could be external, 
a rise in interest rates, or as I am seeing today, rising energy or raw material costs that cut into the bottom line of many companies. Once you determine the cause, you can decide whether the problem can be fixed and profits restored to previous levels. When I find a company whose profit levels are well below the rest of the industry, I want to know what its competitors are doing differently. Can management make the changes that will let the company catch up with its peers? 7. Does the company have one-time expenses that will not have to be paid in the future? Often you will find situations where earnings are temporarily depressed by a one-time expense or charge. These could be costs associated with a merger or acquisition, or the closing of a factory. Other one-time charges include the costs of lawsuits such as seen with tobacco and firearms companies, or the closing of unprofitable divisions. If it is truly a one-time expense, one can assume that earnings will return to prior levels and the stock could rise. 8. Does the company have unprofitable operations they can shed? Many times, as in our example of ABC Ice Cream, a company will have a division that is losing money while its main operations are making money. Perhaps a retail chain has stores that are not up to the level of the majority of stores. If these divisions and locations can be sold or closed, earnings will rise as the losses are eliminated, I have seen this many times with companies such as James Crean, a small Irish conglomerate that engaged in a wide variety of businesses. At first glance, the stock didn't appear that cheap but repeated insider buying piqued my curiosity. A closer look showed that it was selling several divisions and the ensuing proceeds would firm up the balance sheet. In 1997, the company was actually selling at just 65% of the then adjusted book value. In 1996, I came across a small company by the name of National Education. It had two profitable divisions and two that were losing. Money. Once management made the needed changes, the stock doubled in. Price. Getting rid of the money-losing operations in many cases is all the catalyst a company needs to see substantial gains in the price of its stock. 9. Is the company comfortable with Wall Street earnings estimates? Although I rely very little on the estimates when looking for stocks or estimating their value, I like to know if management is comfortable with the earnings estimates the street is making. If they feel they are too high or too low, I know that missing the earnings will likely cause the stock price to fall, while exceeding the estimate will often cause the price to move higher. 10. How much can the company grow over the next 5 years? How will the growth be achieved? I like to get some idea of just how much the company thinks it can grow the business over the next 5 years. The confidence, or lack thereof, of management in its ability to grow the business gives me a good idea of how much the stock could be expected to rise from depressed levels. I want to know how the company intends to achieve that growth as well. Will it open new locations and enter new markets? Will it acquire other companies to grow the earnings? Will the growth come at the expense of profit margins and return on equity? I like to know that management has a plan to achieve their growth goals and has a good handle on the costs and expenses they will need to grow. Growing revenues alone is not enough if those revenues aren't generating additional profits. 11. What will the company do with the excess cash generated by the business? Every dollar of profit not given to shareholders in the form of Dividends will be retained by the company. What does management intend to do with it? If the company is profitable and generating excess cash what is it doing with it? Does it plan to increase dividends to shareholders? Will it invest in new stores or factories? Excess cash could also be used to acquire other companies or buy back stock. I want to know what return it expects on these investments. The proper use of the excess cash flow can add substantially to corporate earnings and increase profit in the years ahead, which bodes well for the stock price. Poor use of the money could result in falling margins and returns. 12. What does the company expect its competitors to do? It is simply good business practice to know, at least generally, what competitors are planning to do. The expansion plans of Lowe's have a huge impact on the results at Home Depot. 
The growth plans of Walmart are very bad news for major grocery store chains. When one auto company decides to use incentives and rebates to spur sales, all of them have to respond in similar fashion or risk losing sales. If Pepsi introduces a wildly successful new drink concoction, Coca-Cola may have to spend some money to create a competing version or lose market share. As no man is an island, neither does any company operate in a vacuum. It has competition that is out to take away sales and profits. 13. How does the company compare financially with other companies in the same business? I like to see how a company stacks up against its competition. Does the competition earn the same returns on capital? Does the company have more or less debt than its peers? If it owes a lot more money than direct competitors, the cost of servicing the debt may prevent it from keeping up in the years ahead. How does the marketplace value the company? Why does Heinz sell at 20 times earnings when Kraft sells for just 15? What do other investors see that I may be missing? 14. What would the company be worth if it were sold? This question has become more and more important in the day-to-day -day business of evaluating stocks. I first started evaluating stock selection on this basis in the 1970s when it became obvious that some television stations were selling for far less than was being paid for similar companies. The industry standard at the time was about 10 times cash flow for an acquisition, whereas I bought stock in store of broadcasting for just 5 times cash flow. It was eventually bought out at a large premium to the price I paid. Calculating the buyout value of stocks became common practice. In the mid-1980s, we figured out the buyout. Multiples for food stocks and made several great investments in companies like General Foods. Anytime I consider a stock, I look to see at what level of earnings and book value recent takeovers and division sales have occurred. 15. Does the company plan to buy back stock? I look to see if the company announced a buyback and check the quarter over quarter shares outstanding to see if it is actually buying stock. Not all announcements of intention to buy back stock are implemented. Further, many buybacks are done just to offset stock and option grants. I want to see if there will be a real reduction of shares outstanding. 16. What are the insiders doing? Are insiders, company management, buying? Are they selling? I have talked about the positive impact of insider buying but selling is not always a negative. Sometimes people sell for personal reasons, they may need to pay for a one-time expense such as a new home, college education, a wedding. They may be diversifying their estate, or paying a divorce settlement. Look for patterns. An occasional sale by an insider may mean nothing. Consistent sales by many officers and directors are a clear indication that management thinks the marketplace has put too high a value on the company, and they are getting out while the getting is good. By going through this checklist, I come away with a much better understanding of the companies that passed my initial tests for value. I can see which companies are likely to increase their stock price by growing their business and controlling expenses. I can determine the faith of management in the future of the company. The stocks that pass through these questions and have a favorable potential for growth are the ones that make their way into my portfolio. Chapter 15 We are not in Kansas anymore. When in Rome. Foreign accounting is, well, foreign. A.S. We travel around the world looking for value investing opportunities, keep in mind that it's not just the language or food that is different. Accounting will be different. Although the world is moving closer to a more universal accounting system, you need to have at least some understanding of the methods you may encounter. Accounting differences can be a problem but also an opportunity. Not only is accounting different in Europe or Asia, there are dissimilarities within Europe from one country to another. Companies in the United States keep two sets of books, one for shareholder reporting and another for tax purposes. IRS regulations may permit a company to use accelerated depreciation to provide companies with an incentive to invest more in factories and equipment. This accelerated depreciation may not reflect the useful life of the asset, so the shareholder reports will use a slower rate of depreciation that results in higher reported earnings. There is nothing illegal. 
about this. The U.S. tax code is full of all sorts of incentives. In most countries in Europe, companies can only keep one set of books, so the shareholder sees the same report as the tax authorities. This can result in some interesting and valuable anomalies, as I saw with my investment in the Swiss chocolate company, Lint and Sprungly. When I discovered Lint and Sprungly, the shares were trading at 12,000 SF, down perhaps 60% from their previous high. Earnings per share were reported as 1,121 SF for a price to earnings, P.E., ratio of 10.7. This was not bad for a company with Lint's market position and in light of acquisitions of other European candy companies at multiples of pre tax earnings in excess of 10 times. On closer examination, however, it appeared that some adjustments might be in order. Annual depreciation and amortization were running nearly SF 47 million on an asset base of SF 124 million or 37.7% per year. The assets were being depreciated every 2.6 years, which seemed a little short especially the way the Swiss build things. I looked at other candy companies. I spoke to someone at Nestle and asked how the company looked at depreciation. I was told that Nestle calculated depreciation as a percentage of sales, and it was among the highest at 3.5%. Lint was at 6% of sales. The industry average was 2.5%, and so I chose an average of Nestle in the industry for Lint, or 3% of sales. Using 3% cut Lint's depreciation in half from 46.9 million SF to 23.1 million SF, adding 23.8 million SF to pre-tax earnings. Taxing this additional income at the Swiss corporate rate of 35% increased earnings by SF 15.5 million or SF 469 per share. Adjusted earnings per share were then 1,590 SF for an adjusted P-E ratio of 7.5, which was one of the lowest P.E. ratios for a major consumer franchise in the world. As you can see, while it may be an aggravation to understand accounting differences, doing so often leads to incredible opportunities. I found numerous accounting anomalies of this sort as I researched companies in Europe. Almost uniformly, the odd accounting practices resulted in a company reporting lower earnings and lower asset values than would be the case under U.S. accounting standards. Working through the European accounting differences turned out to be a treasure hunt while sorting through accounting quirks in the United States is more like navigating a minefield. American companies are more likely to put their best face forward to their shareholders so they can justify management's bonuses and increase the value of their stock options. Only recently have European companies even had stock options, and the level of executive compensation has traditionally been much lower than in the United States. Both European and Japanese companies have traditionally been more concerned with conserving cash, which often means writing off assets faster. This practice reduces reported earnings but increases cash. Non-US managements place a greater emphasis on strong balance sheets. Trading in foreign shares used to be much more difficult. With the increased globalization of financial markets, buying and selling stocks in most developed countries is pretty much the same. Many of the larger issues around the world are listed on several exchanges including the New York Stock Exchange and NASDAQ markets in the United States. Most of the listings are in the form of securities called American Depository Receipts ADRs. These securities were introduced to reduce the difficulties involved in buying shares in foreign countries. Right now, there are roughly 2,200 ADRs traded in the United States including such corporate giants as GlaxoSmithKline, Toyota, and Nestle to name a few. As the stock brokerage industry has gone global, it has made it possible for virtually any brokerage firm to buy shares in foreign companies that are not listed on a U.S. exchange. Although you may have to put forth a bit more effort to understand the differences around the world, it is worth it. The global approach to value investing provides many more opportunities to invest your money. Chapter 16 Trimming the Hedges Currencies confuse even the experts. 
Global investing presents another significant variable to investing only in U.S. stocks and that is currency. Foreign stocks are quoted in foreign currencies. While a foreign stock may rise in its quoted currency, if the currency falls in relation to your own base currency, you may lose part or all the benefit of the rising stock price. In the 1980s, until the introduction of the euro, we had to deal with approximately 20 currencies among the developed countries of the world, and they all fluctuated vis-a-vis -vis each other. Trying to figure what the Italian lira was going to do versus the Spanish peseta versus the US dollar would have been a challenge for Einstein. Sometimes these fluctuations were mild, other times they could be dramatic. In the period from 1979 through 1984, the value of the British, French, German, and Dutch currencies declined between 45% and 58% against the dollar. Similar declines in the Standard & Poor's Index would have driven investors into cash with lightning speed. Given this complexity and volatility, it makes sense to hedge your investments in foreign stocks to eliminate the effect of currency fluctuations vis-a-vis -vis your base currency. With the introduction of the euro in 1999, the currency problem has become much less complex. Instead of having investments spread over 20 or so currencies, you will probably have 90% of your investments in four currencies, the euro, the British pound, the Swiss franc, and the Japanese. Yen Hedging is fairly simple. If you buy 1,000 pounds of British tool and die, you are not only betting on the stock, you are betting on the British pound. If the stock goes up but the pound goes down, you can lose part or all of your gain in the stock if you sell and convert your proceeds back into dollars. Conversely, if the stock goes down but the pound goes up, the rise in the currency may eliminate your loss in the stock. You can create many permutations of this exercise, and it can all get a bit confusing. However, if you hedge your investment in the £1,000 that you now own by virtue of buying the British tool and die stock, you will only enjoy or suffer the results depending on whether the stock rises or falls in British pounds. Here is how it works. Your investment in the stock was worth £1,000 when you bought it. Since the stock is valued in pounds, you own the equivalent of that amount of currency. To eliminate the currency risk, you sell £1,000 using something that is called a currency forward contract. It is like selling a stock short. You don't own the stock, you just borrow it. With the currency forward contract, you don't own the currency either, but you do own the equivalent amount in your British tool and die stock. You are hedged. You are long and short two instruments that are equal in value. When you sell your stock, you simply close out the contract and get paid back in dollars. There is another school of thought on foreign currency investing. Most investors who buy foreign stocks do not hedge their currency exposure. They simply accept the added fluctuations that come with foreign stock investing and let the chips fall where they may. Long term, 10 years or more, the investment results for being hedged or not being hedged are pretty similar. Both methods have in common a choice to be currency agnostic. Either you don't want any currency effect, or you don't care. A recent study by the Brandeis Institute bears this out. Results from year to year can differ. Significantly, but long term, the currency movements tend to cancel out. The choice is up to the investor. What does not work is switching from a hedged to an unhedged approach depending on how you think currencies will fluctuate. Again, the Brandeis study reaches the same conclusion. Those who attempt to divine currency movements have generally had poorer results than those of us who choose one method and stick with it. I have always taken the position that what I think I know how to do is analyze companies, not countries. I like to stay within my circle of competence. Chapter 17 it's a marathon, not a sprint. It's time in the market, not market timing, that counts. Many people believe that the fastest way to the highest market returns is by short-term trades that are accurately timed. If you type stock market timing into an internet search engine, you will receive hundreds of thousands of hits. Bookstores and websites alike are full of the holy grails of trading in stocks. 
how to pick bottoms, how to pick tops. They use voluminous studies, ancient mathematical ratios, and even astrology to determine when stocks are ready to advance or are in danger of falling. There are some who say that you should buy and sell based on who wins the Super Bowl. Sell in May and go away is often heard from those who believe that the month of the year or day of the week can predict the rise and fall of stock prices. But in more than 35 years in the investment business, I have yet to find a short-term timing strategy that works. All nature of pundits have come and gone over the years. For a short time, any of them may be right, and may make one or two amazingly accurate predictions. Eventually, all of them lose the interest of the public when the predictions prove inaccurate. I simply do not believe that there is a way to accurately and consistently time short-term market movements, and again, the research of scholars seems to bear me out. It is simply better to be in the market, invested in the value stocks that offer the highest potential return, than to play the timing game. Between 80 and 90% of the investment return on stocks occurs around 2% to 7% of the time. In fact, a study by Sanford Bernstein and company showed that from 1926 to 1993, the returns in the best 60 months, or 7% of the time averaged 11%. The rest of the months, or 93% of the time returns only measured around of a percent. It strikes me as a daunting task to find a way to reliably predict the 7% of the time stocks do well. As a long-term investor, the real danger and threat to your nest egg is being out of the market when the big moves occur. You simply have to accept that you must endure some temporary market declines. Long-term, value investing is like flying from New York to Los Angeles. While you may encounter some air turbulence over Kansas, if your plane is in good shape, there is no reason to bail out. You will eventually reach your destination safely, and probably even on time. The same goes for investing. If your portfolio is well constructed, a bit of market turbulence is no reason to bail. You will reach your financial goals. The reality is, and it's been proven, that the biggest portions of investment returns come from short periods of time but trying to identify those periods and coordinate stock purchases to them is nearly impossible. Two issues are at play here, both equally important, one, short-term timing doesn't work, and, two, the highest returns are achieved by being fully invested in the market at nearly all times so that you can capture the times when stocks rise the most. You have to be in the game to win it. Predicting short-term stock market direction, however, is a fool's game and a disservice to the investing public. Long-term, the market is going up. Always has, and mostly likely always will. Market timers like to think they can capture large returns by jumping in the market to profit during periods when stocks are up, and jumping out of the market when stocks are down. This activity is not unlike the maneuvers of the driver who keeps switching lanes on the freeway when there is heavy traffic. He thinks he can pick the lane that will move fastest for the next 100 yards. Never seems to work. A mile ahead, you pass him. Market timing is the same. It may get you ahead for a brief period but you will quickly give up gains when abrupt events that could never have been predicted, such as the tragedy of 9-11, geopolitical events, and even weather cause brief downturns that are almost always followed by rising prices. You will also give up your profits to the increased costs of trading from commissions to taxes. All manner of studies have proven, in many ways, under many scenarios, that the majority of investors buy high and sell low. Peter Lynch, the legendary and highly successful manager of the Fidelity Magellan Fund for many years, once remarked that he calculated that more than half of the investors in his fund lost money. This happened because money would pour in after a couple of good quarters and exit after a couple of not-so-good quarters. Nobel Prize winner William Sharp found that a market timer must be right a staggering 82% of the time to match a buy and hold return. That's a lot of work to achieve what could be accomplished by taking a nap. Even worse, other research shows that the risks of market timing are nearly two times as great as the potential rewards. Between 1985 and 2005, 
the annually compounded rate of return for the Standard & Poor's 500 index was 11.9%. Over that 20-year period, $10,000 invested in an S&P 500 index fund would have grown to $94,555. However, a recent research study concluded that the average investor only compounded at 3.9% over that period with $10,000 merely growing to $21,422. Why? The research paper concludes that most investors head for the hills during periods of market declines, thinking the decline will go on indefinitely. Once the market has rebounded, they return, having missed the best part of the rebound. One of the more difficult factors in maintaining a long-term approach is that prices are so widely available. We can check the value of all of our stock holdings day by day, minute by minute. We can see how they fluctuate around short-term factors, and in many cases this information can make us a little nervous. A prime example of this is an acquaintance of mine who had a portfolio of municipal bonds worth $700,000. He was a successful commercial real estate broker who saved at least half of his earnings each year. His money was invested for the long term, and he could afford to leave it invested. But he could not stand to see the prices of stocks rise and fall. Each day. If he owned a stock and it closed down on a particular day, he was deeply upset. I guess he did not realize that bonds also fluctuate in price but since he could not check their closing prices every day, he was not worried. He got his regular interest check, which he reinvested and was happy. Over the ensuing 10 years, I calculated that his municipal bond portfolio grew to $1,140,226 at an assumed interest rate of 5%. If the same funds had been invested in the Standard & Poor's 500 index, he would have made $2,906,639 before taxes at a 15.3% annually compounded rate of return. If this investment was taxed at a 40% rate, his after-tax nest egg would have grown to $2,023,983. His loss for not being invested in stocks was $883,757. According to an American Century Investment Study, if you had ridden out all the bumps and grinds of the market from 1990 to 2005, through the go-go 1990s into the severe sell-off from 2000 to 2002, $10,000 invested would have grown to $51,354. If you had missed the 10 best days over that 15-year period, your return would have dropped to $31,994. If you had missed the 30 best days, one month out of 180 months, you would have made $15,730. Had you missed the 50 best days you would have come out a net loser, and your $10,000 would now be worth only $9,030. Would you take a minute-by-minute -minute pricing approach with anything else you own? How would you react if your house was priced every day and the quotes listed in the local newspaper? Would you panic and move if you lost 2% of your home's value because a neighbor didn't mow his lawn? Would you rejoice and sell if it went up 5% in one day because another neighbor finally painted his house? A collection of businesses bought at excellent prices is no less a long-term asset than a piece of real estate and should be treated the same way. Prices will fluctuate both up and down. What is most important is that you own the right stocks when the market does go higher. Like devotees of the lottery, you have to play to win. Using the tenets of value investing and always keeping in mind the margin of safety, the odds of winning with our approach are a bit better than playing the lottery, and it's far more remunerative than sitting on the sidelines. The evidence is clear. It is pretty close to impossible to consistently make money market timing, and you are better off investing for the long term, riding out the bumps. Value investors have the extra security of knowing that they own stocks that have one or more of the characteristics of long-term winners and that they have paid careful attention to investing with a margin of safety. Chapter 18 Buy and Hold Really? How should you choose between stocks and bonds? When people think about how to structure their portfolios, they often seek professional advice. Many times it is good, often it is not. 
financial advisors are risk averse. However, their risk aversion may have less to do with your financial situation than their reputations. Conventional wisdom, the accepted standard, is that a portfolio that is invested one-third in bonds and two-thirds in stocks is the way to go irrespective of the level of your assets. The major brokerage houses issue asset allocation formulas depending on their view of the stock market in the near term. Sounds just like market timing to me. However, people are different. Your financial assets and your needs vary tremendously. The one-third, two-thirds formula is the standard. It is safe because that is what the herd recommends. But what if you have a gazillion dollars and need only a pittance to maintain? Your lifestyle. Why would you invest one-third of your money in an underperforming asset? I admit to being an iconoclast. However, I think that the two most important considerations in formulating an asset allocation formula are age and how much money you have to support your desired lifestyle. If you are young, which I define as somewhere between 20 and 35 and have a job that pays your bills, you can take a long view on investments. My partner, John Spears, read Jeremy Siegel's Stocks for the Long Run, 3rd edition, which showed that in every rolling 30-year period between 1871 and 1992, stocks as measured by an index, beat bonds or cash in every period. In rolling 10, year periods, stocks beat bonds or cash 80% of the time. Bonds and cash did not beat the rate of inflation over 50% of the time. So why would anyone own a bond? The answer comes back to age and need. In 1987, a friend of mine asked me if I would take over managing an account he had with another money manager. I agreed, and he set the wheels in motion to transfer the account to my firm. The transfer was completed in mid-September 1987. He then told me that he would be liquidating the account at the end of that year to invest the proceeds in a real estate deal he was working on. I told him that he should liquidate the account immediately and sit on the cash. He wondered why the rush. I explained that his need for the money did not anticipate any setback in the stock market. If he could not be in for the long term, he should not be in. In late September 1987, I liquidated the account. He missed the crash of 1987, and to this day, he is convinced that I knew it was going to happen. As much as I would like to be credited with great foresight, it was no more than common sense that led to. My advice. The crash of 1987 came as much of a surprise to me as it did to the rest of the world. In the early 1980s, a longtime client sought my advice on structuring her assets. Her husband had recently passed away leaving her with a $4 million account at my firm and in addition she owned $30 million of Berkshire Hathaway stock. Her husband had been an early investor in Warren Buffett's partnership and had held on to all his Berkshire Hathaway shares. My client had always worked and previously never had need of income from her investments, but she was anticipating retiring and needed some income going forward. She had lived comfortably, but modestly, given her wealth. She calculated that she would like about $200,000 per year before taxes to maintain her lifestyle. She had consulted an accountant who had drawn up a plan that met her requirements for income, inheritance to her children, and charitable gifts. Since her Berkshire Hathaway stock had a cost basis of about $20 per share, he suggested a charitable remainder trust into which she could put the Berkshire stock, sell it without paying any capital gains taxes, and reinvest the proceeds in bonds for current income. I told her that the reason she was so rich was because all her assets had been well invested in stocks, and asked why she would want to stop enjoying the benefits of future appreciation. Based on how long her mother had lived, she was likely to go for another 35 years. Her accountant replied that she had all her assets in the stock market which was, by definition, risky. I replied that even if the stock market dropped 50%, she had enough money to live comfortably until the age of Methuselah. So she decided to leave everything as it was, and I would provide her income needs out the money she had invested with my firm. A number of years later, she called to review our plan. 
I asked her how much money she had. She said $180 million. I suggested that she leave it alone. Today I figure that she has upward of $300 million. Another client's father died prematurely in 1947 leaving his mother $1 million, an enormous amount of money in those days. That year, my parents bought the house I grew up in for about $7,000. A Cadillac cost less than $2,000, and a year at Harvard was around $1,500. Since women had to be protected from the concerns of money in those days, his father left the money in trust with a bank. To ensure a steady income for his mother, the bank invested the estate in tax-exempt municipal bonds yielding 4%. An annual income of $40,000 per year in 1947 left her on Easy Street. However, no one thought she would live for another 45 years, which she did. When she died in 2002, she still had $40,000 per year income, but it was worth a lot less than it had been in 1947. I calculated that if her original $1 million had been invested in the S&P 500 stock index, and that if she had been allowed to spend 4% of the assets every year, by 1998, the year I did this little exercise, she would have had $44 million and an annual income of $1,760,000. Fortunately, her sons were successful in their own right and were generous to her in her later years. I went to college in the late 1960s with a number of rich kids. They had gone to exclusive prep schools in New England, lived on Park Avenue or Fifth Avenue in New York, or in grand houses outside Philadelphia or Boston, or in Tony communities like Greenwich, Connecticut, or the North. Shore of Long Island Having been raised in far more modest circumstances, I was a bit envious. The $7,000 house I was raised in had appreciated to $27,000 when my parents sold it 20 years later in 1967. When I started working in 1969, I would search through the proxy statements of the companies that were the source of the wealth of the rich kids from my college days. Generally, the really rich kids' dads had fortunes between $5 million and $10 million based on their stock holdings, a pretty good sum for the day, but not enough to guarantee the next generation the same lifestyle. Tax the estate by 50%, divide by three children, and each heir got about $1,660,000. Not bad, but not a ride on easy street. Unfortunately, many of these children not only were unlikely to inherit vast wealth, they also were not prepared for the rough-and-tumble world of raw capitalism that was about to debut in the 1980s and 1990s. In 1976, a good friend of mine and his wife bought a grand apartment on Park Avenue in New York. After haggling over the price for six months, they bought the apartment for $120,000, which was equivalent to $15 per square foot. It was an 8,000-square-foot apartment with five bedrooms, five fireplaces, and five maids' rooms. The seller was thrilled to have unloaded this white elephant, which was costing him $2,500 per month to maintain. Today, similar apartments in the same building sell for $25 million. Inflation is the slow-growing and pernicious disease that erodes wealth, and until something better comes along, stocks are the only way to keep up with inflation. While a bond will return your principal at maturity, that principle may be worth far less in terms of purchasing power when you get it. If you don't need to tap into your nest egg to live, you can afford to take the high-octane approach to investing. You can ride out any bumps along the way as you try to maximize your long-term returns. However, if your time horizon is shorter and you draw money from your nest egg to live, a bit more prudence is required. I like to think of an investment portfolio as a college endowment. Colleges take a fixed percentage out of their endowments annually to fund various programs and scholarships. Most colleges draw out 5% per year and invest the balance so it will grow at a rate faster than 5%. They hope to earn investment returns that are at least equal to or greater than the rate of inflation plus the 5% they are spending. This enables them to maintain the purchasing power of the endowment in perpetuity. Individuals should structure their financial affairs in a similar way. 
Spend an amount you think is less than the long-term returns you think you can earn on your portfolio. 5% is not a bad place to start. If your portfolio can grow at 10%, you can increase the amount you spend at the same rate as inflation. However, stock portfolios are not passbook savings accounts. Your returns will fluctuate from year to year. For this reason, I like to keep three years of spending in short-term bonds to smooth out any down years in the portfolio. Leave this money on the side and only dip into it in a year when your stocks are down. If you do this, you will not have to sell stocks when they may be cheapest to pay the rent. Stock markets can and have taken more than three years to recover to their previous high. This was definitely the case in the 1970s and is the case today. It has taken the Dow Jones Industrial Average and the S&P 500 Stock Index six years to get back near their highs of 2000. The Nasdaq. Forget about it. It is still way underwater. My own experience over the years is that although the broad market averages can take longer than three years to recover after a particularly nasty bear market, most value investors make up their losses in far less time. Value managers, by and large, seem to avoid the periodic market bubbles that result in painful losses. The conventional model of portfolio construction, the one-third bonds two-thirds stocks, requires that you periodically rebalance your holdings. By this, they mean that if your stocks had a particularly great year and now are 75% or 80% of your portfolio, you should sell some stocks and invest the proceeds in more bonds. That is like selling your winners and reinvesting in your losers. How smart is that? If you already have enough cash to ride out three down years, why do you need more? Unlike an endowment, you do not have to worry about perpetuity. But the last thing you want to do is run out of money in your old age. However, also unlike an endowment, you have to pay taxes on your gains that are not held in a tax-deferred retirement account. Portfolio rebalancing forces you to realize gains and thus pay taxes. It is important to focus on money managers and mutual funds that do not have a lot of portfolio turnover. Long-term capital gains earned on stocks held for at least a year are taxed at only 15%, as are dividends. Short-term capital gains and interest income from taxable bonds are taxed at much higher rates, as high as 34% depending on your tax bracket. And that is before any state or local taxes. There are several mutual funds with very low turnover. They look for stocks that are reasonably priced and that will grow over time. This is the power of compounding. Turnover is the enemy of compounding and the friend of the Internal Revenue Service. Most funds now report their gains before and after taxes. It is helpful to compare the two. If after-tax gains are significantly lower than pre-tax gains, it is an indication that the fund manager is making his broker happy with a lot of trades and spending your money on brokerage commissions. A lot of what you do in investing is just simple common sense. Trying to optimize your returns by switching mutual funds or messing with your asset mix will more than likely reduce your return. Many investors think they should be proactive and keep looking for ways to tweak their investment portfolio when just sitting tight, if they made the correct choices in the first place, often would be the better course. Chapter 19 When only a specialist will do How do you pick a money manager? The purpose of this book has been to explain the tenets of value investing so that you can benefit from the investment strategy that has been shown to have the best long-term success. You may or may not choose the do-it-yourself route. If you have the time and the inclination to do your own investing, that is great. However, it is more important that you understand the principles of investing and know what questions to ask a possible manager or financial advisor. If you do, you can choose from the thousands of money managers for mutual funds who would be more than happy to manage your investments. Morningstar is a great service that tracks thousands of mutual funds. It breaks the funds down into style categories, shows performance, market caps, and examines the managers and explains their investment approach. Morningstar is not the final point in your search for the best money managers, but it is a good place to start.
Through the years, I have sat on the investment committees of various foundations and university endowments. I have had the opportunity to interview managers competing to manage a portion of the organization's assets. Although I have often been the one competing for accounts, sitting on the other side of the table, being the interviewer, has been instructive, if not a bit more fun than being the interviewee. The search for a money manager usually begins with an investment style choice. An investor, individual or large endowment fund, may want to add a value manager or a growth manager, someone who invests in large caps or small caps, and so on. Many large institutional pools of capital try to have managers who cover the spectrum of investment styles because different styles work better than others from time to time. If all styles are brought in under the investment umbrella, they hope not to underperform their peers or the broader market for any short-term period. My problem with this approach is that it reinforces short-term thinking. If you know one style does best in the long run, maybe you shouldn't care about short-term performance comparisons. You also run the risk of building a portfolio that may look a lot like an index fund but with much higher costs. Better to go with an index fund and avoid all the management fees. The typical money manager interview starts with a presentation of the manager's style and capabilities, all of which are, of course, excellent. Then comes the question and answer part of the meeting. The questions are usually the same, as are the answers. Money managers are not dummies. They know what the client wants to hear. The first question is, do you do your own research? Absolutely. No one ever admits to reading brokerage firm research. Hundreds, if not thousands of security analysts at big brokerage firms are producing reports that no one reads although some of this research can be quite good. Second question, do you visit the companies you invest in? Again, the answer is absolutely, and money managers usually claim that they will only talk to the CEO or the CFO. This is cause for concern, given the number of money managers demanding lengthy, personal interviews with corporate CEOs and CFOs, I have to wonder who is running these businesses. One manager I interviewed claimed to make 250 company visits a year. That's one for every business day. Given travel time and the need for some sleep, when did this manager have time to read the annual reports? I have heard claims of 400 visits a year, and the all-time winner had a staff that made 4,000 visits. There isn't enough time to read 4,000 research reports in a given year. The third question institutional investors usually ask is, do you have a succession plan at your firm? The client wants to know who will take over if something happens to the money manager. Every money manager has a good answer but concern for my well-being aside, unless I or any other money manager is 80 or 90, the interviewer should assume we plan on sticking around for a while. Limiting oneself to younger managers or only those managers with detailed succession plans would have ruled out Warren Buffett as a manager option. Still would. Lastly, the clients always want assurance they will have direct access to the manager. Why not just watch what the manager puts in your portfolio and leave them alone to do what you hired them to do in the first place? I have a different set of criteria that you can apply to mutual funds as well as individual money managers. First, does the manager have an investment approach and can explain it to you, or any layperson, in plain English? and has the manager applied it consistently over time? If you can't get direct face time with the manager, read all the shareholder letters and other promotional material published by the mutual fund for at least the past five years. Is it consistent in its approach to the market, or does the manager change horses midway through the race? Second, what does the track record look like? Would you have been satisfied with the returns earned if you had been invested with them in the past? My preference is for at least 10 years of performance because that takes me through several market cycles. This is not always possible, but I would not go with less than a 5-year record. It is also a good idea to note how volatile the returns have been. Some investors have a low tolerance for volatility, and you don't want to be scared out of the market just when stocks are their cheapest. Third, whose record is it? Does the manager who produced the returns that you find acceptable, 
still run the fund? Whenever a fund changes managers, you can often expect a change in the management style unless the new manager apprenticed with the former manager for a long time. I interviewed a manager who presented a 25-year record of investing in growth stocks. The record was pretty good, not great. My biggest problem was that the manager was only 36 years old, so unless he began managing the fund when he was 11, much of the record was not relevant. Fourth, what do the managers do with their own money? Are they invested in the fund alongside the money you intend to invest? Managers should eat their own cooking, as we say. They should be willing to assume the same investment risks they are asking you to assume by investing in their fund. There is something comforting about knowing that managers have their own money on the line. It keeps them from taking undue risks if they hit a rough patch in performance. While this is not always a true indicator, I prefer funds where the individuals running the fund are also the owners of the investment management firm. If the firm is run by mutual fund marketers and salespeople, they may have more interest in gathering assets than managing the money well. The marketing types also tend to be short-term focused, which puts pressure on the manager to make short-term investment decisions that may not be in your best interests. Money managers who also own their firm are freer to make long-term investment decisions, as only a client can fire them. These managers just have to convince their clients to stay around during some period when relative performance lags. The secret to winning in the investment business is to pick good managers and stick with them. Chapter 20 You can lead a horse to water, but You can't make it drink. By now, I should have made a good case for value investing. Let's recap a few key points. Value investing is straightforward, it does not require a superhuman set of brain cells. The average person can understand the logic of it all. Buy a dollar for 60 cents from some unsuspecting seller and wait until the person wants it back for a dollar. Most of the legends of the money management business pursued a value strategy, and they enjoyed or continue to enjoy careers spanning more years than the average age of many of today's hot money managers. Warren Buffett opened shop in 1957. He is still going strong 49 years later, which is the approximate age that some of the leading investment banks suggest their partners retire. Bill Ruan set his firm up in 1969 and remained active until just before he passed away in 2005. Walter Schloss started in 1954 and retired 49 years later at the age of 87. Others like John Neff, who ran the Windsor Fund, Jean-Marie Evelard, of the Sogen Funds, and Bill Nigren, of the Oakmark Funds, had or continue to have long, successful careers. I have even been at it for 36 years, and I am still active full-time. And two of my partners, John Spears and my brother Will, have been my partners for 31 years and 29 years, respectively. We have all shared the same investment philosophy, value investing. And we aren't going to change this far into the game. In a world where the average institutional account stays with a firm for three years, and the average mutual fund investor about the same, this is quite a record of achievement. It has been my observation that value investing works long term, and that the strategy has never, to my knowledge, experienced any of the infamous blow ups of racier, sexier investment styles. From time to time, you read about managers who recorded 100% losses in a matter of days or weeks. I've never seen a value manager on those lists. There will always be managers who excel for a period of time, although they do not follow a value investment philosophy. Some will even excel for fairly long periods. However, they are the exception. The true value adherents are in the majority of managers who have beaten the market over long periods. So, if value investing is so smart, if it has been proven to be so successful, why do so few money managers or investors adhere to its principles? The answer is not intelligence. It is temperament. A whole field of academic study has emerged to analyze why investors, professional and individual, persist in making bad investment decisions despite empirical evidence that could guide them in the right direction. It is called behavioral psychology, 
and it was the topic of numerous seminars, conferences, books, and papers, some of which I cite in the bibliography, in the late 1990s and early 2000s. Money management attracts some of the brightest and best educated people in the world. It does so because it is highly lucrative, and success can be measured daily at the close of the stock market. Mr. Market grades you on a daily basis rather than waiting for an annual salary review. The more IQ points you have, the more confident you become about your ability to be a successful money manager. Moreover, clients reinforce this point of view by seeking out experts who might have some secret ability to navigate the markets, much like the lost souls that trek to the Himalayas to find a guru who can reveal the secret of inner peace. All too often, money managers appear on the covers of financial magazines like movie stars on mountain bikes. They train physically so they will have the stamina to deal with. Turbulent markets. If only they would take a few hours to understand what successful money managers do, they could skip all the kickboxing and mountain climbing, or spend more time doing it as a leisure activity, if they find these sports enjoyable. A herd instinct dominates the money management industry. If 95% of the money managers buy stock A and it goes down, there are no adverse consequences. After all, 95% of these smart managers were of the same opinion. However, if you were among the 5% who went against the herd and bought stock B, and it goes down, everyone says that you are a dummy. The reputational and career risk of being a contrarian is far greater than the risk of going with the flow. Value investing requires the ability to go against the herd, and to risk being called a dummy from time to time. In 1999, I received a letter from an investor asking, how long are you going to stand around like ostriches with your heads in the sand waiting for the second coming of Elvis? He said that there was value in technology and sent a list of stocks that on average were trading at 100 times earnings. Having seen cycles like this before, my partners and I stuck to our knitting with our low price to earnings and low price to book value stocks. We held tight to the principles that had served us so well for decades. In the end, the boom went bust and our style was vindicated, and the stocks the shareholder had recommended were down about 90% a year later. Warren Buffett once said that returns using the value approach are lumpy. There will be periods of underperformance to achieve higher long-term results. I know that, most of our investors know that. Nevertheless, it can be difficult for even committed value investors to remain steadfast in the face of so much hype and excitement. Value investing also requires the metal to buy those stocks that the majority of investors don't want to own. They have warts. They are out of favor. Of course, they are. Why else would they be cheap? When you go to cocktail parties and the talk turns to recent stock picks, one guy can say, I bought Ionosphere Communications this morning at 10 and it closed at 12. Instantly, he is a genius. Forget that Ionosphere Communications has no sales and no earnings and is a disaster waiting to happen. You feel a bit foolish saying, I bought ABC Ice Cream Corporation at half of book and six times earnings. You are greeted with a big yawn. Sex sells even in the stock market, and everyone wants to own the latest sexy issue. Value stocks are About as exciting as watching grass grow. But have you ever noticed just how much your grass grows in a week? Most people seek immediate gratification in almost everything they do including investing. When most investors buy a stock, they expect it to go up immediately. If it doesn't, they sell it and buy something else. Value investors are more like farmers. They plant seeds and wait for the crops to grow. If the corn is a little late in starting because of cold weather, they don't tear up the fields and plant something else. No, they just sit back and wait patiently for the corn to pop out of the ground, confident that it will eventually sprout. Overconfidence is another significant psychological flaw of most investors and money managers. People make changes in their portfolios because they are confident they are making a change for the better. Without that confidence, they would merely sit still. At a seminar during my 25th college reunion, I performed an experiment that psychologists have conducted on numerous occasions. 
In a group of people of approximately the same intelligence, everyone is asked to rate their investment skill relative to everyone else in the room on a scale of 1 to 10. We know the average has to be 5. Half will be smarter, half won't. However, the result of this experiment is consistently 7.5. It is just like Lake Wobegon, where everyone is above average. What else can explain the field of active money management when the reality is that only about 15% of money managers will beat an index over long periods of time? The managers and their clients must be confident they can beat the index despite empirical evidence that shows the vast majority will not. They all just believe that they will be the ones in the top 15%. The same tendency toward overconfidence shows up in portfolio turnover rates. Again, investors sell stocks and buy other ones because they think the new stock will do better. Research has shown that overly confident investors trade more and make less. In a study of 100,000 trades by customers of Charles Schwab, the stocks that customers sold were 3.4% higher one year later than the stocks they bought. Investors who are less confident in their ability to make profitable decisions are more likely to sit still. The speed of trading is directly coordinated to the investor's individual confidence. In addition, investors who trade the most, tend to buy riskier stocks. They are looking for more action, confident that they can jump ship. Before it runs up on the rocks. To quote Blaise Pascal, most of men's problems arise from their inability to sit quietly and alone. This rapid day trading is not confined to individual online brokerage customers seeking a Vegas fix. Many professionals are just as prone to the overconfidence syndrome. Jason Zweig, of Money Magazine, reported in a Peter Bernstein newsletter that in 1959 the average mutual fund had a portfolio turnover rate of 16.4% and the average holding period for a stock was 6 years. Today, the turnover rate is well over 100% and still heading higher. Confidence is partly to blame, but peer group pressures also encourage this behavior. The investment world now equates activity with intelligence. If you are a portfolio manager, you are paid to act. You should be aware that selling Pfizer today and buying Johnson & Johnson is a smart move. Merely sitting with a portfolio of good stocks you have carefully researched and selected is not enough. Sooner or later, someone upstairs will notice a lack of activity in your portfolio and will ask why. You could say you just happen to prefer the stocks you own to the others out there, but that sounds wimpy. It implies a lack of market savvy and a lot of indecisiveness. So you trade in a futile effort to improve returns. Everyone knows that stock markets go up and they go down. Fortunately, the long-term trend is up. Otherwise, who needs stocks? Long-term, everyone says their goal is to beat the market, and nearly all investors claim that they are conservative. In the short term, however, the investor's view may vary. When markets are rising, they want to do better than the market. When markets are falling, they want to lose less than the market. In rising markets, many investors throw caution to the wind in an effort to beat a rising market. In declining markets, many investors head for the exits to conserve their net worth. Winning on both sides of the stock market cycle is no small feat however, in the 31 years from 1975 through 2005, the S&P 500 has risen more than 20% in 12 of 31 years, nearly 39% of the time. If you just did as good or nearly as good as the market in those years, you should be happy. In the not-so-good years, the S&P 500 either lost money or rose at a rate less than half its 31-year average compounded. Rate of return of 13.5%. Good long-term performance results from beating the market in the bad times. Caution should not be seasonal. One should not rediscover caution when markets are falling and forget about it. When they are rising. Maintaining a steady state of mind, whether we are in good times or bad, is the key to successful long-term investing. Many smart and deservedly respected market observers advise investors that beating the market is a formidable task. 
whether it is because advisory fees and transaction costs are too great a burden to overcome, or investors and money managers alike make badly timed decisions, beating the market is almost impossible. They still counsel investors to stay in stocks but to do it through index funds. While it is true that long-term index funds will beat most money managers, 85% by some estimates, index funds are not a silver bullet. The S&P 500 year-end peak in 1928 was 24.35. Following the crash of 1929 and the Great Depression, it did not reach that level again until 1952, a span of 24 years. Dividends were pretty generous over that period, so investors with dividends included would have recouped their 1928 investment a number of years earlier. Following the 1972 year-end peak for the S&P 500, it took five years for investors to be whole with dividends. Reinvested And from the year-end 1999 peak, through the end of 2005, 6. Long years, the S&P 500 with dividends reinvested is still 7% below its December 31, 1999, value. Patience is a virtue, but waiting 5, 6, or 20 years just to get your money back is a stretch. My own observation of value managers is that they tend not to go through such long performance droughts. Why? Even indexes can be victims of bubbles. The three periods cited previously all followed periods of excess in the market, the Roaring Twenties, the Nifty Fifty period of the early 1970s, and the tech bubble of the late 1990s. In all cases, the excesses of a relatively small number of hot stocks distorted the performance of the S&P 500. Most recently, in 1999, the technology sector of the S&P 500 accounted for more than 30% of the index versus a historic average of about 15 or 16%. At certain times, an index is not a conservative investment. Jeremy Siegel, the renowned finance professor at the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania, has also been an advocate of indexing. In his book, The Future for Investors, he made the case for customized indexes, which are now possible. He found that indexes that exclude the highest P.E. stocks and include some smaller and mid-cap stocks did far better than the broader index. In essence, value counts. An index that emphasizes lower P.E. value stocks does better. I could have told him that years ago. Being a contrarian, which true value investors are, is not easy. Lots of pressures are working against you. The wild swings of momentum and growth investing tend to subject investors to more thrills, and ultimately more spills, than the value approach. Value investing is more like a long trip to a pleasant destination than a ride on a roller coaster. Chapter 21 Stick to your guns Years of practical experience have taught me that the patient exercise of value investing principles works, and works well. My partners and I have all had long, successful careers and have done very well for ourselves and our investors using the techniques outlined in this book, as have numerous other value devotees. In fact, I don't know a single poor value manager who has been in the business more than 10 years. Value investing requires more effort than brains, and a lot of patience. It is more grunt work than rocket science. But over time, investors should continue to be rewarded for buying stocks on the cheap. Through the years, there have been changes in the methods of finding value stocks, and in the criteria that define value. When Ben Graham began managing money in the late 1920s, there were no databases, there was no internet. The information age had not arrived. Back then, the search for undervalued stocks meant pouring through the Moody's and Standard & Poor's tomes for stocks that fit the value criteria. Now, you can accomplish this with the click of a mouse. We can access almost all the data we need off a CD-ROM or our Bloomberg terminals. We no longer have to run around gathering 10K reports or annual shareholder letters. They are all right there. On the internet for us to access for US and non-US stocks all over the world. Trading has changed as well. 
For the most part, trading is now done electronically with no effort at all. We can trade stocks in Tokyo or London just as easily as we can in New York. When we need to discuss a stock or enter orders, we can communicate from the office or anywhere else we may be via cell phone or wireless laptop computers. However, this change has been relatively recent. For 60 years, from the days when Benjamin Graham went into the business in the late 1920s beyond when I started in 1969, the improvements in communication, the way people traded stocks, and the availability of information remained much the same. We had touchtone phones and direct lines, but not much else. I can remember buying the firm's first calculator. It was clunky and heavy, and cost a lot even by today's standards, but it did have a new invention called memory. There was no Nasdaq stock market in 1969. Over-the-counter stocks were still listed on the pink sheets and you had to call brokers for quotes. Everything was recorded on paper, and stock certificates were still delivered by runners. Ben Graham pored over Moody's and Standard & Poor's manuals and so did I. The first database of company filings appeared in the mid-1970s from a firm named Compostat. In the beginning, we would call Compostat, tell them the criteria we wanted them to use in screening stocks, and they would send us a tape we could run on our own computer. We had a computer by then, but the term desktop had not yet come into being. We now take for granted the explosion in information availability that has taken place in the past 10 or 15 years and wonder how anyone functioned before email, Windows, and Google. Just as the access to information and the methods of trading stocks have changed in the past two decades, so have the criteria for value changed. One of my first jobs when I began my career in 1969 was looking through the Standard & Poor's monthly stock guide for stocks selling below net current assets. This was a primary source of cheap stocks in those days. The method had been pioneered by Graham and was very successful. Generally, we were buying stocks that sold for less than their liquidation value. Back then, manufacturing companies pretty much dominated the U.S. economy as they had for decades. As the U.S. economy grew in the 1960s, 1970s, and 1980s, it began to move away from the heavy industrial manufacturing companies such as steel and textiles. Consumer product companies and service companies became more a part of the landscape. These companies needed less physical assets to produce profits, and their tangible book values were less meaningful as a measure of value. Many value investors had to adapt and began to look more closely at earnings-based models of valuation. Radio and television stations and newspapers were examples of businesses that could generate enormous earnings with little in the way of physical assets and thus had fairly low tangible book value. The ability to learn new ways to look at value allows you to make some profitable investments that you might well have overlooked had you not adapted with the times. Along the way I also learned that there was a great deal of money to be made buying companies that could grow their earnings at a faster rate than the old industrial type companies. I believe it was Warren Buffett who made the statement that growth and value are joined at the hip. The difference between growth and value was mostly a question of price. I paid a little more than I might have in the old days of just buying stocks based on book value but found great bargains like American Express, Johnson & Johnson, and Capital Cities Broadcasting. Companies like these were able, and in many cases still are able, to grow at rates significantly greater than the economy overall and were worth a higher multiple of earnings than a basic manufacturing business. In the mid-1980s, the leveraged buyout business was born. The U.S. economy was emerging from a period of high inflation and high interest rates. Inflation had increased the value of the assets of many companies. For example, if ABC Ice Cream had built a new factory five years ago for $10 million and was depreciating it over a 10-year period, it would have been written down to $5 million on ABC's books. However, after five years of inflation, it might cost $15 million to replace that factory. Its value is understated on the company's books. Using the factory as collateral, the company might have been able to borrow 60% of its current value, or $9 million. This is what LBO firms did with all sorts of assets in the 1980s. 
they would borrow against a company's assets to finance the purchase of the company. Additionally, the record high interest rates of the late 1970s and early 1980s drove stock prices to their lowest levels in decades. The price-to-earnings ratio of the Standard & Poor's 500 was in the single digits. With long-term treasury bonds yielding 14%, who needed to own stocks? The combination of significant undervalued collateral and low P.E. ratios made many companies ripe for acquisition at very low prices. A typical deal in the mid-1980s might be done at only 4.5 times pre-tax earnings. Today, that number is more in the range of 9 to 12 times pre-tax earnings. This period was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to buy companies at record cheap prices in terms of both assets and earnings. I try to track as many acquisitions as I can, noting the price in relation to book value and pre-tax earnings. By doing so, I can construct a model of acquisition values. I use this model to screen for companies that are selling in the stock market at a significant discount to what an LBO group might pay. The LBO model gave me one more way of defining cheap. I call it the appraisal method. I still use low price to book value ratios and low PE ratios to search for undervalued stocks, but I have added the appraisal method as a third leg of my value stool. If there is another way to find stocks that sell for far less than they are worth, I like to take advantage of it. The methods and criteria have changed over the years, and they will evolve further with the march of time and inevitable change. What is important is that the principles have not changed. The basic idea of buying stocks for less than they are worth and selling them as they approach their true worth is at the heart of value investing. On balance, value investing is easier than other forms of investing. It is not necessary to spend 8 hours a day glued to a screen trading frenetically in and out of stocks. By paying attention to the basic principle of buying below intrinsic value with a margin of safety and exercising patience, investors will find that the value approach continues to offer investors the best way to beat the stock market indexes and increase wealth over time. Patience is sometimes the hardest part of using the value approach. When I find a stock that sells for 50% of what I have determined it is worth, my job is basically done. Now it is up to the stock. It may move up toward its real worth today, next week, or next year. It may trade sideways for 5 years and then quadruple in price. There is simply no way to know when a particular stock will appreciate, or if, in fact, it will. There will be periods when the value approach will underperform other strategies, and that can be frustrating. Perhaps even more frustrating are those times when the overall market has risen to such high levels that we are unable to find many stocks that meet our criteria for sound investing. It is sometimes tempting to give in and perhaps relax one criterion just a bit, or chase down some of the hot money stocks that seem to go up forever. But, just about the time that value investors throw in the towel and begin to chase performance is when the hot stocks get ice cold. Benjamin Graham laid out the basic concepts of the value approach to investing many decades ago. Like Graham, I have no faith in my ability, or in the ability of most others, to predict the direction of stock prices over the short term. I do not believe that many people can detect which technology stock will be the next Microsoft or which ones will bomb. What I do know is that owning a diversified portfolio of stocks that meets the standards of a margin of safety and are cheap, based on one or more valuation methods, has proven to be a sound way to invest my money. I have no reason to believe it will not continue to be so. Don't take my word for it. I don't expect you to simply take my word for the continued success of the value method of investing. I admit to bias, value is how I make my living. Fortunately, there exists independent confirmation by many academics and scholars who have relentlessly studied what does and what does not work in the stock market. The following is a quick review of the major studies and their findings. U.S. Stocks one of the first studies done on P.E. ratios and performance was authored by Professor Sanjoy Basu of McMaster University. 
In Investment Performance of Common Stocks in Relation to Their Price-Earnings Ratios, he looked at stocks listed on the New York Stock Exchange from 1957 to 1971. For each year he divided all the listed stocks into five equal groups or quintiles and examined their future performance. He found that value stocks far outperformed their growth peers with a hypothetical $1 million investment growing to more than twice what the higher PE stocks would have achieved. In his study, Decile Portfolios of the New York Stock Exchange, 1967, 1985, Yale professor Roger Ibbotson ranked all the stocks in 10 equally weighted groups, deciles, according to their PE ratios. He examined all listed stocks from 1966 to 1984 and found that the cheaper, less popular stocks gave far greater returns. In fact, $1 invested in the cheapest stocks grew to over six times as much as the highest P.E. ratio companies and twice as much as those in the middle of the pack. He also looked at how stocks selling at very low multiples of book value compared with growth stocks selling at much higher multiples of asset value. He sorted all the stocks on the New York Stock Exchange, NYSE, into deciles, groupings of 10, for each year and compared the performance of each group. He looked at stocks from 1967 to 1984 and found that stocks priced very low compared to book value outperformed the glamorous names by better than 2 to 1 and the market as a whole by better than 75%. One of my favorite studies that I often refer to when discussing the merits of the value versus growth approach to investing was done by Joseph Lakanashak, Robert Vishni, and Andre Schliefer entitled Contrarian Investment, Extrapolation and Risk. It ranks all the stocks on both the New York and American stock exchanges by P-E ratio in deciles. Each portfolio was held for five years and then sold. They found that across the range of five-year holding periods, the low P.E. stocks offered almost twice as much return. Imagine, twice as much in as short a time as five years. They also ranked stocks by price-to-book ratio, also in deciles, and held them for five years. They examined stock prices from 1968 to 1990. Once again, those selling cheapest when compared to book value outperformed by a very wide margin, almost three times the more glamorous stocks, over the five-year holding period. In this same study, they found that the low price-to-book stocks outperformed growth selection in 73% of one-year holding periods, 90% of three-year, and 100% of the five-year holding periods. One of the most exhaustive examinations of the performance of value. Stocks was done by Richard Thaler and Werner F. M. de Bont, then professors at the University of Wisconsin and Cornell University, respectively. In a 1985 edition of the Journal of Finance they published a paper, Does the Stock Market Overreact?, that looked at the idea of buying stocks that had gone bump in the night and performed poorly against those that had shone in the sun and performed the best. They examined stock prices starting in December 1932 through 1977, a period covering 46 market years. They looked at the 35 stocks on the New York Stock Exchange that performed the worst over the prior five years against the 35 listed stocks that had been the brightest stars. They compared the results of investing in each basket with an index made up of an equally weighted portfolio of all stocks on the NYSE. They found that, on average, over the next 17 months, the worst stocks gained about 17% more than the index, and the bright. Stars of the past faded quickly returning about 6% less than the index. Over the time period. They also studied holding the portfolios of stocks over three years and found that the prior, bad, stocks continued to far outperform the best past performers. In 1987, Werner F. M. de Bont and Richard Thaler further sorted stocks into quintiles, groupings of 20, in their research paper, further evidence on investor overreaction in stock market seasonality, and found that the stocks selling below book value outperformed the market by more than 40%, or almost 9% a year. In a study that compared P.E. ratios within industry groups, professors David Goodman and John Peavy of Southern Methodist University ranked stocks within industry groups across more than 100 different industries according to P.E. ratios. 
They sorted all the different groups into quintiles and found that even within more specific groupings, the stocks with lower price to earnings ratios far outperformed the higher priced stocks. A dollar invested in the bottom quintile of each group, rebalanced annually, grew to over 12 times the highest P.E. group and more than twice those with the second lowest P.E. ratios. In their 1992 study, The Cross-Section of Expected Stock Returns, Eugene Fama and Kenneth French examined all non-financial stocks included in the Center for Research in Security Prices files, perhaps the most comprehensive database of stock prices. Their study covered the period from 1963 to 1990. They used deciles of stocks ranked according to price to book. Value The lowest price to book value stocks returned almost three times as much as the highest over the 27 year time period. They also looked at holding the portfolios of stocks over three years and found that the prior bad stocks continued to far outperform the best past performers. Global stocks As discussed, Stocks that have value characteristics perform well in and outside the United States. It was a delight to serendipitously stumble on some value opportunities in Japan when we found insurance companies selling for one-third of book value in the 1980s, but independent research confirms that all around the globe buying stocks selling below book value is a sound idea. I found of particular interest a study done by Mario Levis, a professor at the School of Management, University of Bath in the United Kingdom, that looked at all the stocks in the London Share database. He looked at stocks from 1961 to 1985 and sorted them into quintiles. Once again, the lower P-E ratio stocks outperformed more exciting growth companies by an extraordinary margin. Over that time period, $1 invested in the lowest price to earnings ratio group returned more than five times the highest ratio stocks and double that of those in group two. Performance was three times as high as the companies in the middle group of P.E. levels. In a Morgan Stanley research paper titled, Ben Graham Would Be Proud, Barton Biggs examined the return for low price-to-book value investing around the world. About 80% of the stocks in the study were outside the United States and, once again, the cheap stocks outperformed the more expensive as well as the world market indexes. Nobel Prize winner William Sharp looked at stocks in Germany, France, Switzerland, the United Kingdom, the United States, and Japan in his Financial Analyst's Journal article in 1993 titled, International Value and Growth Stocks. He examined stocks in the S&P 500 in the United States and stocks included in the Morgan Stanley Capital International Index for the other nations. He ranked the stocks every six months. The top 50% of stocks in price-to-book value were the growth portfolio, and the 50% that sold lowest compared with asset value were the value portfolio. From 1981 through 1992, the value stocks outperformed the growth stocks in each and every country by a substantial margin. Losers to winners Academic research also supports many value investing techniques. James Perturba of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and Lawrence Summers of Harvard, who later went on to become Secretary of the Treasury and the controversial President of Harvard, in March 1998 published a paper entitled, Mean Reversion in Stock Prices, Evidence and Implications. They looked at monthly stock prices on the NYSE from 1926 to 1985 to determine if large price increases or decreases were followed by reversals or continued in the original direction. They found that current high investment returns tended to be followed by lower returns, and low investment returns tended to lead to higher performance. In total, they examined stock price reactions in 17 nations including the United States, the United Kingdom, Switzerland, Canada, Japan, Belgium, and the Netherlands. They found that stock prices tended to act the same all over the globe. Today's worst stocks became tomorrow's best, and the darlings of the day becoming the spinsters of the next day. Insider Buying In What Has Worked in Investing, a paper authored by Tweedy, Brown, we examined several key studies that show the tremendous outperformance of stocks with insider buying. 
We looked at five key studies that showed that stocks with insider buying outperformed the stock market by at least a 2 to 1 margin. We also looked at several studies that examined insider buying in countries around the world and found that insider buying was predictive of higher returns on a global basis as well. Only a few countries outside the United States require insiders to report transactions, so the information is not as useful. Fortunately, the field of academic research into financial markets is ongoing and prolific. Many papers have looked at the relationship between insider buying and future returns. One such study by Thomas George and Mijat Sihan of the University of Michigan looked at over 1 million transactions over a 21-year period. They found that stocks with insider buying outperformed the market by over 6% over the next 12 months. The conclusions shared by Professor Sihan and myself are further borne out in a study by Fuller Thaler Asset Management entitled Extrapolation Bias, Insider Trading. In 2001, Andrew Metrick of the Wharton School, Leslie Jang of Boston University, and Richard Zeckhauser of Harvard released their paper, Estimating the Returns to Insider Trading, a performance evaluation perspective that confirmed these findings. They looked at insider activity and stock prices from 1975 to 1996 and found that those companies with insiders buying stock outperformed the overall stock market by about the same 6%. A 2003 paper by Joseph Piotrowski and Daryl Rollstone of the University of Chicago found that insider buying signaled that earnings and cash flow would improve over the next 12 months, leading to a higher stock price. They looked at stocks selling at low earnings multiples or below book value between 1984 and 1995 and found that companies with these characteristics with heavy buying by insiders dramatically and substantially outperformed the market. They also found that those with high multiples and insider selling tended to underperform by a wide margin. The same held true for companies that bought back stock. One of the first studies into the effect of stock buybacks was done in a Fortune magazine article by Carol Loomis in 1985. She looked at all the stocks in the value line universe from 1974 to 1983 and found that companies that bought back stock earned 50% more annually than those that did not. A study by University of Illinois professors David Eikenberry and Joseph Lakanishak in 1994 looked at companies that bought back stock from 1980 to 1990 and found that over the next four years they outperformed the market by 12.1%. For those companies that had other value traits selling at low prices to earnings or book value the professors found that the outperformance was over 45%. Another study done by Professor Eikenberry with Conan Chan and Inma Lee, found that companies that bought back stock between 1980 and 1996 averaged 6% more than the market over 12 months and 23% over 4 years. In his most recent study released in 2005, Eikenberry looked at stock buybacks by companies with good earnings and low valuations. He found that, between 1980 and 2000, companies that repurchased stock outperformed by better than 35% over 4 years. The latest look. Lest you think that we rely only on older studies to prove the worth of buying stocks with low prices when compared to earnings, a study from the Brandis Institute, a part of Brandis Asset Management, a venerable value firm, repeated the work of Lakanishak, Vishni, and Schlieffer on U.S. stocks, updated it through 2004, and also conducted a similar study of international stocks. Its research showed that the low P.E. ratio stocks, when tested from 1969 all the way through 2002, have far outperformed the higher priced growth issues. In addition, Professor Lakanishak, along with Louis Chen at the University of Illinois, updated his studies through the year 2002 and found that the value strategy of buying stocks cheaply based on earnings continued to vastly outperform other stocks. They also released a study that examined returns on U.S. stocks from 1986 through 2002. They looked at stocks that they called falling knives, a play on the old Wall Street adage of never trying to catch a falling knife. They defined falling knives as stocks that had fallen 60% in price over the prior 12 months. 
they found that although these stocks did indeed represent a risky proposition with a bankruptcy and failure rate for times that of the market as a whole, as a group they far outperformed the market over 1-, 2-, and 3-year holding periods. Not surprisingly they found that the larger the market capitalization of the company, the higher the outperformance and the less the chance of corporate failure. As one of the chief tenets of our value investing approach is to always maintain a margin of safety, the likelihood of buying into an undercapitalized or poorly financed falling knife would seem to be lessened, giving us an opportunity for further outperformance of the market averages. The Brandis Institute updated this work and took a global look at falling knives in a 2004 paper titled, Falling Knives Around the World, Examining Stocks from Around the World from 1980 to 2003. As with the previous study, it looked at companies with a market capitalization of over $100 million that had fallen 60% in price after the price collapse. Not only did the falling knives in the United States continue to show marked outperformance over the market as a whole, this outperformance held true around the globe. Value Investing Works It has worked in actual investing and it is confirmed by many research studies.